101.1 FM KFUG Crescent City. You are listening to Counter Culture Radio. I'm your host, Dan Schultz. We have Jim Willie of GoldenJackass.com, editor of the Hat Trick newsletter. Welcome to the show. Uh, it's good to be back. It's been a little while, and uh, we've got more breakdown developments and a, a lot of things going on. And gosh, you know, it, it's hard to get accustomed to uh, on, a, on a daily basis to the concept that we're facing global change, like paradigm shift, major shocks. It, this, this is hard to adjust to. And for instance, I, I'm, I'm having some minor sleeping pattern alterations, and it's, it's not pleasant. Yeah, you, you know, I think it's one thing to realize, yes, okay, this is the decline of an empire, and but to live in historic times, not only to live in historic times and see the, the standard of living issue, I think it's probably more difficult than anything for Americans. We're so used to our luxuries and conveniences and comforts struggling, or maybe the lack of food. Uh, maybe Hollywood is helping us with all these dystopian films, but it, it is something, you, you mentioned pre-show, that, uh, you know, it, it's a little weird, and, you know, and, and to some degree, we're we're projecting, we're speculating, we're, you're, you're, we're predicting this future, but it, it, it certainly seems mathematically, and as you so well describe these patterns, this information that you're collective, this inductive reasoning that you do so well, Jim, that, that things really are changing. I think since Lehman, since the housing bust, since the mortgage finance collapse, subprime and all that, since the Lehman event in 2008, the U.S. citizens, the population, have suffered a quantum decline, a one-step decline in their standard of living. Uh, it's from the aftershock of exporting outsourcing industry that resulted in a shock with dependence on housing and finance, housing and mortgage finance. The, the 2008 collapse was the shockwave realized from two decades of outsourcing. In the next few years, we're going to see, I think, two more quantum level declines because the U.S. is going to lose its dollar. Well, hold uh, on a second, Jim. I have an article right in front of me. You obviously haven't read it. Associated Press says that a surge in hiring last month helped drive the nation's unemployment rate down to a six-year low of 5.9%, within striking distance of what economists consider a healthy level. Clearly, you didn't get the news. Well, I get different news. I get reality news, <laughs> not toilet paper garbage. Uh, that that news report has to do with the people who are still accepting, still receiving state unemployment insurance. What I prefer to look at is the shadow government statistics, which is showing 23% or more unemployment and a fast-falling participation rate. Now, we, we've got just tremendous decline. All you have to do is drive by a few malls. Yeah. And, and look at how many are closed shops. All you have to do is read about what's going on in Detroit where entire neighborhoods are being bought by the Chinese while entire neighborhoods are being disconnected from water and electricity. We've got vast tracts of U.S. now being purchased as industrial parks by, by foreign carpetbaggers. And they're holding treasuries in their purchases. You know, we got a lot of weird things going on right now. The, the suppressed gold price has resulted in quite a few mining companies cutting back on budgets for exploration and projecting as an industry a 50, 50% decline in gold mine output in the next year or two. So, you know, these are, these are end game characteristics and, uh, yeah. I, I'm getting more and more indications on what this end game is looking like, but I believe Europe, especially Germany, uh, is critical for the quantum changes to come for the United States. Germany, Russia and China. Why is Germany so important? Well, Germany is the powerhouse European economy. Uh, they're the only European economy with a tremendous industrial base that did not get shipped off to China. For instance, Spain, a lot of the industries, factories, 
foundries, small shops for producing things, they all get shut down. They're, they're gone. They're dead. And it's no wonder that their economy is going to hell in a handbasket. No wonder that their austerity plans are not resulting in anything positive. Spain's going to hell with their economy. Their debt's going out of sight. And Germany is still trucking along. They've got some dents, some bumps from the Russian sanctions. But Germany is important because it has largely, as a nation, been financing the European Union for its debt provision. The southern nations experience the debt. The Germans come in and buy it. Bailouts come in for Greece. The Germans finance the bailout. The Germans are really fed up with this. Uh, the, the Germans are the most critical element of the European Monetary Union that, that shares the euro currency. They're the one with the trade surplus. So I think this year they're you know pretty much near zero or slightly negative and the current year is going to be, I think, a little bit negative, but not, not horrible. On a per capita basis, Germany should have one-third of the U.S. size. Now, they're 85 million, so uh, not quite four times smaller, but three to four times. All right, the U.S. has a $400 billion trade deficit. Does Germany have a $100 billion trade deficit? No, they're roughly even. Uh, so the U.S. Is the, is the critical dead element walking, the zombie walking. Germany is the most critical member of the European Union. They own 90% of French government debt. They own significant portions of Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and Greece debt. They're I'm curious, Jim. Why? I mean, it must be self-serving to a degree. Why does, why does Germany foot the bill for this stuff? Because they're elite signed them up for the euro currency. They're that elite. Saved the currency, huh? Well, their elite had an agenda, and most of the Europe, most of the Europe, most of the German citizens did not want to give up the Deutschmark. They did not want to join the European Union. They did not want to have a euro common currency. They did not want to follow <laughs> what some call the revived Roman Empire. It's never worked. I believe the European Union was brought together in order to kill it. I have some really nasty news. I shared it with my uh, subscriber base in the last month. But do you remember the Germans requested in 2011 a gold repatriation? Right. They asked from the New York Fed for their 330 tons back. That was three years ago. Well, last year, pretty much the New York Fed admitted, no, you're really not going to get it back. Uh, then late this past year, early this year, we heard that they got seven tons back. I mean, there are lots of side stories about fabricating a new war in Mali, and uh, just it's just insane. The U.S. likes to have a war to steal somebody's gold. But I found out the proximal cause for the German request of their gold repatriation, and, and some people erroneously state this is the Germans' gold reserve. No, it's not. It's it's not even one tenth of their gold reserve. They got they got over four thousand tons. So this is one tenth or less. I found out the proximal cause. Back in two thousand and eleven, in early months, the Obama administration, State Department, I think the NATO advisors gave a briefing to the German government about their planned war in Ukraine, their planned coup d'état, their planned separation of Europe from its energy supply in Russia, the planned interruption to the Gazprom pipelines, and the Germans said, are you out of your mind? And then they said a few days later, we want our gold back sitting in the New York Fed. We got 330 tons there. You guys are insane. We want our gold back. And the New York Fed wouldn't even let parliamentary delegation from the German government even see their gold. It's all gone. All right. So the, the break with Germany started three years ago. I point out four, I call them indictment charges. The gold repatriation, okay, fine. Related to that is the impact to the, to the German economy from Russian sanctions. I mean, so far it's kind of kids play, kid gloves, child's play with the, the sanctions that Russia imposed in reverse on uh, agricultural products, food, meat, whatever. The, th the third violation in the indictment is the NSA. It's not eavesdropping. They're not trying to find out Merkel's sex toys or Merkel's lunch plans. They're trying to find out the German 
strategy with working with Russia and China for a return of a gold standard. They're trying to get integrated into the Siemens telecom system, eavesdropping for entire German society for their phone calls. And the fourth violation is something that doesn't get sufficient press. The Germans are fed up with the Draghi Euro Central Bank and their plans for bond monetization. He's got a plan for far more than, than just buying um, Southern European sovereign bonds you know, the, the, the tainted, low-quality sovereign bonds. Draghi has a plan to buy up all kinds of mortgage bonds. He has a plan to buy up, you know, corporate bonds. He has a plan to buy stock market packages from indexes. He has a plan that's far more diverse than the Fed, but not as big in volume. And the German high court, along with the Bundesbank, their central bank, has been saying, we don't want this. We don't want you to do any bond monetization. It's all bad. It's no good. There's, there's tremendous negative consequences. There are unintended consequences. We want you to stop. And Draghi said, no, it's necessary. We need the stimulus. You hear the word stimulus a lot, Dan. It's mm -hmm. not stimulus. It kills capital. The bond monetization kills capital because what it does is it, it in an unsterilized way, which means they're not removing funds elsewhere, they're just shoving in a lot of money into the system. And the smart players, the, the ones who actually try to defend themselves, are buying up commodities and hard assets. What The result is a rise in the whole cost structure, including food. So businesses have shrinking profit margins. More of them shut down. This is what they call stimulus. Business shut down from higher cost structure. It's not stimulus. Right. In the Wales summit, this was early September, Angela Merkel, of the German chancellor, indicated an impossible set of alliance commitments. It didn't get much press. In fact, all they did, did was talk about, oh, Wales is over. It's all good. Everybody was shaking hands, and uh, we got some little minor complaints about Ukraine, but uh, we're, we're all on board. What they didn't report is that Germany was essentially saying, we cannot honor the NATO commitments. And last week, Germany and France reiterated, they cannot honor the NATO commitments. What was it that they couldn't honor? Commitment to war, commitment to missile missile placements, commitment of fighter jets, tanks, men, the war commitment. They cannot honor the commitment for war. Mm. NATO is about peace. And lately, it's about war. The U.S. has turned the dollar defense into a war exercise and sanctions. Yes. On the financial side, sanctions. On the, on the military front, it's war. And the consequence is severe economic impact. Now, we're seeing the bond yields in, in Europe <clears throat> hit, uh, hit, hit ra radical lows. I, I featured uh, in my recent report the Southern European bonds, and they're all way down in yield. Okay, well, what's behind that? Well, the stock markets weren't all that bad, you know, going into mid-September. So you had stock rally and bond rally. Can you say the Draghi Euro Central Bank? They're buying up the stock market. They're buying up the bond market. This is not a legitimate exercise of free market enterprise. The free markets are gone. Yeah. And we just had news yesterday, reiterated today, German factory orders in August alone down 5.7%. Export orders down 8.4%. The Germans are split. <clears throat> They've got their, their bankers led by the politicians. I'm sorry, the politicians led by the yeah. banks. Yeah, I got that backward. The, the bankers and their you know leash holders as leash holders to the politicians. And on the other side, you've got the, the corporate chieftains, I call them, the executives. And they're telling... They told Merkel right before the Wales NATO summit in early September, they told Merkel, back off. Just make a statement, make a stand, back off. And, and that was the beginning. And last week we saw a continuation of that. And uh, I think we're going to see more. Uh, the, the, there are three to 5,000 German companies that do business with Russia, some significantly. All the giant German companies, the conglomerates, they all do significant work and trade with Russia. They're not going to give it up. Damn, they're not going to give it up. Just just today, Serbia 
in, in Eastern Europe, Serbia announced that they're going to continue with the South Stream construction. Russia announced that the Black Sea connection is just about complete, if not complete. So we're seeing many nations pay lip service to the United States government while uh, working with the Russians quietly. I'd like to have access to NSA files and hear actually, you know, who do the, in quotation marks, leaders of Germany and these other nations, who do they listen to? Do they listen to the bankers? Who do they follow? Or do they listen to their corporate master? I wonder to the degree, do they really care about their people and their economy? I suspect that half of these people are sociopaths and the other people are just concerned about themselves and getting elected or you know, how much money they have. I, I, I wonder if Merkel really does orders. care about the German economy. They're following orders, Dan. And the, the, the tough well, question is, orders. whose orders? I have a rough idea and it, it has to do with the agenda of dragging down the European economy, the European system, the whole financial structure, while the U.S. is being dragged down, and the installation of a Western Europe and North American totalitarian fascist state. So, who's giving the orders? I believe it's the Rothschild family. They're the owners of over 80% of the global central banks, the major owner, major partner, uh, there are only a few central banks in the world that are not run by the Rothschilds. They are Iran, Syria, and North Korea. All the rest are basically run by Rothschild entities, partners, or people who take orders. Even Russia? Perhaps not Russia. I, I left them out. Uh, I, I don't. I, there's a lot of debate right now as to what extent that family has for Russian and Chinese central bank dealings. I'd like to leave that alone because we've got enough to talk about with Europe. It's a debatable point. It's something that, that deserves continuous research. And uh, I, I'm of the mind that the BRICS are not dominated by the Rothschilds. And the biggest piece of evidence for that is that Basel, Switzerland, the Bank for International Settlements, is, is making a formal request on a regular basis for a role in the BRICS finance team, offering their experience. So what you've got is a pack of wolves knocking on the huge hen house factory barn, saying we'd like to be included as your guards. Will this fracturing of NATO and Germany and will they break off in time to save a regional or a world war? I think it's pretty clear that the economic damage and the truce in Ukraine, followed by the continuation of the Gazprom pipelines, will ensure that Germany and most of Europe will turn their backs on the United States. Wow. I think the economic impact of the Russian sanctions is devastating. The, the lesson is pretty simple. Join the U.S. and lose your economic footing with a very serious impact. Recession, industrial output decline, job loss. These are the fruits of U.S. alignment. So join the Ukraine war with sanctions, only to lose a large trade partner with huge potential in Russia. Russia is European. Their, their Siberian side is where a lot of their, their, their mines and their, their drilling, their, their resources and, and minerals are east of the Urals. But they've got, a, they've got a European entity. And what the U.S. is trying to do is cut off Russia, European Russia, from Europe. And it, it's just not going to work. The Kremlin gave a sample of the cutoff taste uh, with the blockade of, of food, this, the reverse sanctions of food imports. And, and the, the most devastation, the greatest damage is with Spain. They're, they're seeing their food rot. The Russians were ready, and they got a South American alternative supplier. I think it was arranged during the World Cup when Putin and Merkel were talking with uh, the, the Brazilian leaders in the, the, the elite box at the World Cup finals. The hidden threat is, uh, I think, something not discussed at all. China could enter Southern Europe and do acquisitions of large agri-farm businesses that are struggling facing bankruptcy, violations of bank covenants, 
they come in and they take on a big stake and later a bigger stake and before you know it controlling interest and they export the Spanish food to, to China so this is not in the news notice the Kremlin has not used their big natural gas card in a big way it, it, it's a huge card it, it's a powerful thing uh, I hear the phrase of sort of Damocles yeah okay they have not said, hey, look, stop all of your sanctions. Just stop it, or we're going to cut off all the gas to Europe. They haven't done that. They have a dependence of income from the European purchase of their oil and gas. Just a quick fact, of all the German natural gas used, 40% comes from Russia. In Germany, of all the crude oil used in Germany, 30% comes from Russia. So they're not going to cut that off. And if they do, they'll kill their economy. So the economic impact of, of the Russian sanctions is, is very, very harsh. Uh, the changes have already begun. There have been some minor cutbacks, like in Poland. Poland's getting special treatment because they, they threatened also, they threatened a couple things regarding Russia. They said, we'll, we'll do some reverse flow and, and help out Ukraine. Well, that's in violation of contracts. So Russia said, okay, we're going to cut you off by, I think, 28% reduced by 28 percent the gas flow and Poland also was the staging ground for all the Soros mercenaries that did the coup d'etat in Ukraine that they all blamed on Russia I mean it's insane the, the, the stories are insane I heard a a really smart European client and a bit of a source of information to me said recently we in Europe notice things about how you, the Americans are treating Russia they're treating the Russians like the Sudan you can't do that you can't have a coup d'etat by Langley, the CIA, by Soros, and by another security agency starting with an M. I call them mass wipes uh, out of a southeast Mediterranean nation. You can't have those three entities conduct a coup d'etat in Kiev and then blame it all on Russia. You can't do that. You can't treat them like Sudan. So there's some real harsh consequences coming. I wonder, actually, Jim, if that's if some of the actions already taken have uh, crossed the Rubicon. If if we've gone, if they've gone too far against Russia and China. Yes, way too far, uh, and they, they just keep amplifying the damage to U.S. integrity every week or two. Uh, we had a delineation uh, making quite specific that U.S. energy firms cannot do business with Russia. So you know. I don't want to get into a large discussion, long discussion of uh, the bankers versus the energy companies, but we've got some unusual things happening. The, the the bank sanctions are very clear against Russia. The energy giant exceptions, like British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, and Exxon Mobil, the exceptions seem very clear. By the way, I've got a, a forecast that uh, before the end of the year, the current regime in Ukraine is going to fall. It's going to have some impact with Europe in a very strange way. Uh, it's, it's part of the, the truce. The truce is the truce is devastating for the Kiev government, as strange as that sounds. It means that they're going to have to stop fighting and they're going to have to start looking at the damage all around them. You're going to get some requests by Ukraine of tremendous, tremendous aid from the European Union, and they're not going to want to pay it. I mean, like, not $3 billion, but like $20, $30, $40 billion. They're not going to want to pay it. I've also heard a strange item. This is from a very reliable source that a price was put on Poroshenko's head, the uh, leader of the Ukraine government, the leader of the Ukraine coup d'etat, the U.S. puppet. Uh, these guys all have kind of carrying cards from the mass wipes uh, in the southeast Mediterranean coast security agency. So... Price is put on Poroshenko's head, and all of the money that he stole from the previous oligarch is going to be returned. They're going to steal it back. And we're going to get a new criminal running Ukraine because we still have a hands-off. We the, the whole world is telling Russia, keep your hands off. All right, we'll get a, a change of the guard of a different criminal, and maybe another couple or three regime changes in the future we'll see a Russian participation and we'll get a legitimate leader who's more honest I think by the end of the year you're gonna see a regime fall and a new one the coming this year. the end of this year yes oh, wow. they're not gonna make it through the harvest season they got food problems 
they, they may have only planted 80% of the fields in Ukraine and their rich Western farm fields. But what about the commitment of trucks, farm machinery, men, diesel, roadways being accessible? I think they're going to have a disaster in getting the harvest to market. It's going to be a general disaster causing food a food price explosion, a food shortage problem, and they're not going to get through. These guys are already bugging out. I heard in, in mid-September that the ministers in the various offices in Ukraine were leaving the country. So I don't think this regime is going to last much longer. If your predictions come true before, how accurate have you been? Well, since, since the newsletter began in 2004, uh, some significant forecasts have come to pass. I made forecasts at the beginning of the newsletter in 04 and 05 that the U.S. housing market would go bust and we would have a complete collapse of the mortgage finance market and the result would be grotesque insolvency of the U.S. major banks. I think that all came true with the Lehman event and uh, the confirmation came when the Financial Accounting Standards Board in April 1st, 2009 announced, blessed by the U.S. Congress, that all these big banks can uh, cite whatever they want for their assets and portfolios. They can value them all. Don't worry about mark-to-market. Mark-to-market is kind of an inconvenience. So that was one. Um, I had a forecast a month in advance of the Lehman collapse. I got tipped off by the voice. I was telling clients in early and mid-August of the imminent event on the weekend of September 13th, 2008. I was told three entities would fail. I guessed two of them, Fannie Mae and uh, Lehman. I did not guess AIG, but that's okay. The voice told me no one even guessed one of all the people he asked. I got two out of the three. All right, the next correct forecast of significance that I had was I said, following Lehman, we're going to go down to 0%. And then the next one I had was once we got the near 0%, I said it's going to stay there forever. And that's turned out to be true. Here we are five years later. Uh, then the next one I had was I said we we're going to have monetary easing, a, a QE event. So that came in 2011. Once we got that, realizing the correct forecast, I said the QE would go on to infinity with multiple layers of the same QE bond monetization, all of them unsterilized. And we got that. Uh, other hey, Jim, Pat, you don't need to list them all. I just wanted to let the listeners know that you've been spot on. Yeah, well, there's a more recent one to close off that string. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them have been monetary types, but uh, here, here's a zinger. Back in the summer of 2013, the Fed, on the closing months of Bernanke, he was talking about taper talk. We're going to taper QE, and it roiled the markets, roiled a lot of things. I said, he's a liar. I said for three months straight, June, July, August, he's a liar. QE is not going to be reduced. Volume will continue. They depend on it crit critically for the interest rate swap derivative. Zero percent money comes in, short-term bonds, short-term bills, and it tra get, gets transformed into artificial long-term bonds. Uh, demand, all the, the bond demand now is artificial. There are no buyers at all except for tokenism. Uh, by China and maybe Japan, no buyers at all of U.S. government debt, a trillion dollars a year. Okay, I said they were a liar in September. I was proved correct. And now I'm saying that they're lying on the tapering. We're really not going to get confirmations because no one wants to talk about the increase to QE. I think we're going to get an explosion of QE, Dan, as foreign nations dump their treasuries when they realize they're not needed to buy crude oil. And that right. that's coming up real soon. Why I like to have you on the show is... You not only have inside sources, but you see the patterns and you have a, a deep understanding of what actually is happening in the world. There seems to be a, a U.S. government strategy here. I think it's a failed strategy regarding Europe. It, it's like they're courting the fringe and they're losing the core. Here's what I mean by that. They're, they're courting minor nations. Notice that Obama was just seen with uh, one of the Baltic nation leaders, I think it was Estonian leader, who was educated in the United States. These guys are planted fascist puppet leaders. Poland now is a best buddy of the United States. It's suicidal. Poland has never been on the right side of anything <laughs> in the last 100 years. Therefore, you can deduce that. They They're on the wrong Poland. side here. They're used, used as, they offered as a staging ground 
the, the mercenaries for going in for the coup d'etat in, in, Pol uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, the, the Polish are trying to obstruct the South Stream pipeline for Gazprom. One particular leader of the EU, and I, I don't remember the, the firm details, but one of them is a, a fool that uh, is in the U.S.'s pocket, another puppet. So what the U.S. has done is promised the European nations that the U.S. will compensate for the lost Russian energy and commodity provision, in particular the energy provision. We're promising them the LNG provision for, for natural gas. We don't have adequate ships for it. We don't have adequate nodes, those huge things with a funny roof. We're not ready for any of this, yet we're promising this and we're going to lose the core. We got blockades of uh, Gazprom South Stream uh, in, in nations like Bulgaria, uh, nations like Serbia. Serbia just made an announcement they're going to continue with the South Stream. So they're giving lip service to the Americans, accepting the bribes. Hillary and Biden are all over the place in Eastern Europe trying to pave the way to block the South Stream for the Russian gas prom pipelines. It's not going to work. We're seeing the effect of participating with the U.S. plan, with economic sanctions, the backlash, uh, the lost business with Russian imports. This is, this is all disastrous. So I, I heard some estimates that the Baltic nations, as a result of the Russian sanctions, could see at least a 35% and maybe as much as a 50% recession in one year. So I don't understand the mindset of the Europeans who continue to pay attention to the EU commissioners who were all unelected. The EU, EU commissioners are waging war, giving orders to the sovereign nations. These are the warlords. These are the overlords. These are the banker supranational lords, the agents of the Rothschilds. Now, what you're going to see is the, con the continuation of the U.S. plan to court the fringe nations like Estonia, Poland, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and I'm very disappointed in Norway. Norway has made some positive overtures toward the EU when they need to keep their independence because there are no big benefits of closer alliance with the EU. Some of these smaller nations with less developed economies, they think they're going to get some advantages from joining the European Union, like they're going to be able to export a lot of stuff into Central Europe. But th what they're not paying attention to is the stricter standards requirements that very few of them meet. Ukraine does not meet the EU standards. So where's the benefit? <laughs> Ukraine is an absolute disaster. And Norway is so self-contained. They actually do pretty well there and even have food policies where all of the, so many percent, 80, 90 percent of all of their food has to come from Norway, which is why you don't find vegetables there. I mean, they're sustainable uh, compared to other countries anyways. Yeah, they've also got what they call the pension fund. It's their sovereign wealth fund. And I believe it's valued at something on the order of $600 billion. So... Um, it might not be growing much lately from the declining oil price and declining North Sea output from their platforms. The, the best offshore engineers in the world are in Norway, state oil. And to jump on a sinking ship, this doesn't sound like a good move for Norway. No, they're, they're, they're seeing some advantages. I don't know exactly what's going on. I think there's more blackmail and violent threats involved than meets the eye. I'll give you one example. In 2011, there was an example in Oslo of a bombing incident. Again, the lone gunman, you know, the lone worker, the lone guy in the violence. This is the, the, the same old CIA pattern. And what I heard behind the scenes was London was experiencing bank insolvency problems and they wanted a giant infusion of Norwegian funds from their big sovereign wealth fund called the pension fund, Norwegian pension fund. They have $600 billion and Norway told them, screw you. We don't want to get involved with your London bankers. You're a bunch of criminals. We don't want to get involved with you. You're, you know, you've got ulterior motives. We don't trust you. You know, weeks later, months later, they had an Oslo bombing incident. This is insane. We were told that Islamics were all through Norway causing problems with violence. Ah, God, this is nonsense. Yeah. It's so sobering to realize that I, it's, I used to be a red-blooded American, Jim. It's 
so sobering to realize that America is the biggest terrorist in the world. No doubt about it. How awful. To, to defend the dollar, we've resorted to war. Yeah. In 2005, South Korea made an announcement that they were going to diversify some of their treasury bonds. They thought they were overweighted. The next thing you know, a week later, the United States Navy did some military exercises off their coast. We made some phone calls and they changed their mind. That was subtle. Ukraine's not subtle. And Fukushima is not subtle. The Japanese were uh, made announcement that they were going to be working closely with China for a regional new currency, gold-backed. A couple months later, Fukushima hit. Yeah. These are not natural events. Yeah, we have harp. Yeah, that's, that's best not to get into that. Let's just say that you know it happened. Yep. And uh, Philippines announced that they're going to work closely with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, A-S-E-A-N. They wanted to work on the regional currency. They had back-to-back -back hurricanes. They'd never had many hurricanes in Philippines. They have some, you know, damaging typhoons, but nothing like that. A couple months later, the U.S. signed a huge military pact to uh, expand, not just continue, their military base rentals, the leases. Now, to defend the dollar now means go to war. Any nation that wants to drop the dollar uh, from their trade systems, is branded a terrorist, is given sanctions, is treated to propaganda, and we go to war. Yeah, it's not very appetizing, isn't it? It seems like they have no choice. But you're still predicting that the network is going to fall apart, that they are going to jump ship. I think they already have. Germany's already decided to work closely with Russia and China on the new BRICS currency. They're not going to adopt, this is a wrong forecast of mine, it's, not, it's wrong, it's more like a delayed and an altered uh, event. But in 09, I was told that we might have a Nordic Euro that was gold backed. Uh, and its architects, designers would be participant members, would be Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and Finland. They would break away from the EMU, European Monetary Union, meaning the, the, the common euro currency union. And those four nations would uh, go on their merry way. Well, it, it didn't happen. But what, what I'm hearing now is those same four nations. Those are the ones with trade surpluses. <laughs> They're the ones who finance the pigs nations of, you know, Greece and Spain and Italy and Portugal. These four nations are going to go straight with Germany leading, go straight to the BRICS gold and silver back currency. And the letters of credit, the gold trade notes, the letters of credit. And when, okay, this is kind of an end game uh, scenario, but when the dollar is used far less, you're going to see nations say, we don't want any more of your treasuries. We're trying to get rid of them. When the Saudis announced that non-dollar payment for crude oil, and then all of OPEC does the same, you're going to see a lot of nations of the world say, we don't want any more treasury bonds. We're trying to get rid of what we have. So the U.S. economy is going to struggle to be supplied with imports. The U.S. is going to have to abandon the dollar because it's not going to be good anymore. This is when the shock wave hits the United States and the standard of living goes down a couple of notches. The U.S. is going to have to print a new dollar, launch a new dollar. I'm calling it the Scheiss dollar because that's German for shit. The new Scheiss dollar is going to come into being. I'm hearing that, you know, this, there are some printed. They're, they're blood red, which is very appropriate for the Satanists who are running the U.S. government and the banking industry. I'm hearing that it's going to be devaluated twice. The, the Chinese have demanded that it, it be devaluated by 50%, and the U.S. said, well, how about 30% and then later another 30%? The Chinese said, that's fine. We're not in control of our finance anymore. The Chinese now own the J.P. Morgan headquarters. I believe they are now principal partners in the Federal Reserve itself. So the U.S. is going to have a panic to supply its imports, to supply the economy via imports. Because the treasury bond is not going to be good anymore, which means the dollar has lost its currency reserve status. When they go to the new currency, it'll have to stand on its own. Well, what are its fundamentals? So you've got a trillion dollar debt, no buyers of our government debt securities. <laughs> not the best formula for success. The new 
Treasury dollar, Treasury note dollar, as opposed to Federal Reserve note dollar, the new Treasury dollar is going to be devaluated out of the gate by 30%, followed by another 30%. And if you're looking for an example, look at Venezuela. Almost exactly that happened. And devastating effects, not only on import prices up 200%, but other devastating effects where the nation is struggling to maintain its currency and takes its output that it does have yeah. and exports it like food like like industrial output like like tires like you know who who knows all kinds of things made in the United States are going to be exported to try to relieve the imbalance for our currency and to prevent a third 30% devaluation which creates inflation and also creates shortages yes now this That's treasury note right dollar right that you're talking about Jim what does that look like for people with if they have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank when we had these devaluations do they just lop off a percentage is that how it happens I I don't have the answer to that I only have conjecture I mean it's not like I called up JP Morgan to get answers I I mean, you can try 1-800-LUCIFER. <laughs> you might get customer service at J.P. Morgan. Um, I don't have the direct answers, but I'm hearing that there's going to be a reduction in U.S. wealth. It's going to be a downgrade of U.S. dollar-based wealth. And that would seem to me to be consistent with stock account and bank account devaluations. So... I think yes that could happen. I don't I don't know for sure but it seems logical. I'm also hearing that the debts will not be adjusted. So you're going to have a harder time paying off the debts. Yeah. And th there's precedent to that in Mexico in the mid 1990s. The debts were not altered, the currency was worth less, so people had a bigger debt burden as a result. So it, it's all coming. It's inevitable because we've abused the dollar after we forfeited our in our industry. But I like to point out the major exports from the United States are fraudulent treasury bonds, defrauded mortgage bonds, diabetes, genetically modified food seeds, and fast food hamburgers that aren't really beef. And inflation. The United States has no freaking idea what capitalism is. Yeah, we've been. Our idea of stimulating the economy is print money, cover bonds, hand money to people who don't work. That's not capitalism. So as you stimulate so-called with this QE and bond monetization, you raise the costs, you lower the profit margin, you shut down businesses, you remove capital in the form of equipment from active usage, you lay people off, and how do you respond? You print more money. And this is a colossal, vicious cycle to wreck the U.S. economy. And I think it's done somewhat intentionally. You think it's planned? Obama, I was told in 08, was selected, not elected. And his mission was twofold. Wreck the U.S. economy and bring about the end of the dollar. How's he doing? Jim, to wrap this up, what do people look for on CNN as a precipitating event for these dominoes to start falling? Failure of Lehman. Good answer. Zero percent interest rate. Zero percent policy. Uh, QE bond monetization. More war. Yeah. We're already there. So for the final fracture, for perhaps putting the dollar in its coffin, the Chinese announcing that the gold price is 2800 to 3000 per ounce, the Chinese announcing that the new silver price is 50 to $60 in a legitimate market, balancing in equilibrium supply and demand for the metal. Today.